What's up everyone, it's Johnny from Jettle and today I'm gonna to be going through the 2023 HSC Common Module question. So let's have a look at what the question actually was for 2023. For the Human Experiences essay, the question was, a text can ignite ideas about collective human experiences that enrich our view of the world. To what extent do you agree with this statement in relation to your prescribed text? In response, make close reference to your prescribed text. Okay, so in last year's common module question for texts and human experiences, you were actually given a generic question that could apply to any text. Sometimes you're given questions that are specific to the text that you have studied. In this case, everyone got the same question and they had to apply this statement, this question, to their particular text. So it's important to note that this is one of those more general questions and you can get these types of questions from time to time for the common module, but also module A and less likely module B, but module A could also give you a more general module-based question that applies to different texts or sometimes for common module, Module A and especially Module B, you can be given a very specific question about your prescribed text. So you need to be prepared for both and practice in those types of questions. Nonetheless, this was the question for last year. How would I approach it? Well, the first thing to note is, just because it's a new question, maybe it's a question that you weren't expecting or that you haven't seen before. It's probably one that you haven't seen exactly in this form before, but you've hopefully practiced some different types of questions similar to this where They've clearly taken some key words from the rubric about igniting ideas, collective human experiences, and enriching our view of the world, because that's where the questions actually come from. So if you study the rubric, if you go and have a look at the module description for the common module, then you'll find the kinds of terms that they will include in the essay question. So that's your biggest hint. That is your biggest tool there. In addition to looking at practice questions and past questions, it's looking at the actual rubric that includes the types of words that they will effectively mesh together. They'll make these combinations of key terms like motivations, behaviors, paradoxes, inconsistencies. They'll pick a couple of them, put them together into a question, and that's what you'll be faced with on the day. So you can have a look at all those key terms and play around with different combinations, and that will give you some good insight into the types of questions that you'll be asked. But aside from that, the point that I really wanna make from the outset is, just because you haven't seen this question before doesn't mean that you can't use the material that you've been preparing all throughout the year. Otherwise, what a waste. Just because it's a new question doesn't mean your argument, your core understanding of the text is irrelevant. So don't throw everything that you've learned and prepared away. Just be prepared to be flexible, to adapt to the question, to use the key terms of the question all throughout your response but be tying them in with the core points that you wanted to make anyway. That's the key. No one who's getting full marks is going in there and writing something absolutely from scratch that came up with all the wording. They've practiced different questions again and again, and they're using the same core quotes, the same core points. They've got sophisticated insights that they've prepared over time. They're using a course structure that they were already intending to use but they're masters at rewording their points, at reframing, at re-emphasizing, so that the question and the key terms of the question become the core focus of their essay. So you, in effect, want to write a new essay. You don't want to write a pre-prepared essay, but you're using pre-prepared or prepared material to get to the new essay. So that's the important thing. It's fine to familiarize yourself with an essay. It's fine to have memorized quotes and techniques and key effects. And of course you should do that. You don't wanna forget quotes or key elements or key points that you wanna make on the day. You wanna be fast on the day given the time constraints. So have memorized certain material, but don't regurgitate that because it's not gonna answer the question. You wanna use everything that you've perfected over time, that you've timed, cut down, and practiced doing new questions with, and you wanna take all of that and then you wanna be rewording everything on the day to differing extents based on what was already relevant. And then you wanna effectively have created a new essay, a fresh essay that was able to focus on the key terms of the question you were presented with. So that's gotta be your mindset. The mindset is not to get in there and then figure out the structure and to write a plan. You have no time for that. 
You're gonna use what you've prepared and hopefully you've done the preparation because as I've said before, English is entirely about the preparation before the exam. It's preparation, it's a preparation game. So hopefully you've got all your materials memorized or at least familiarized and then you have practiced doing lots of different questions and then you're nice and flexible, you're open-minded about how to adapt to different questions and you're prepared to do that on the day. So you need to have the skill set to adapt. I'm gonna go through how you can actually unpack the question. Now, one thing I do wanna note about this particular question is that it is a to what extent question. It says, to what extent do you agree? You do not need to say, I agree to a large extent with this statement. It should be heavily implied from your argument that that is your perspective. And we will know by how strong your argument is or just what your argument is, the extent to which you agree with the statement. So be clever, be deliberate with the way you word your argument, like try and assert that you're agreeing with the idea that the text is about collective human experiences, but don't say, I agree that the text is about ideas, about collective human experiences. You would say something like, the text ignites ideas about collective human experiences, but, you might say, but, it also emphasizes the significance of certain individual human experiences. And then you might specify what they are. So in that statement, it's like, okay, you're agreeing that there are some important collective human experiences, but you also said, but, and then told us an individual human experience. So the best students will agree. They'll, they'll clearly show how they're agreeing with the question without saying the word agree. And they won't say I, don't say personal language like that. Keep it nice and formal and academic, but they'll make it clear that yes, they're clearly gonna use the words of the question and say, here are the collective human experiences. They're gonna detail that out, but then you'll see certain language occasionally saying, however, or but, or you might say, not only does Orwell enrich our view of the world, but he also does this. And then you say something else he does based on those collective human experiences. So try and use language like not only or but or well also or however, if you really want to extend yourself because that's showing that yes, you can agree with the question and you show your agreement, but maybe an extension of the question. Show how you're going beyond the statement saying, Orwell doesn't just do that, he also does this. And I'm using Orwell and 1984 as an example here, but you could use that for any text or author. Hey everyone, it's Johnny from Jettle, and if you wanna check out state rank examples, band six analysis, step-by-step -step guides to constructing the perfect essays, craft of writing pieces, whatever it is that you need for your English exam, then go to jettle.com. We've put everything in one place for you so that you don't need to look any further to get everything you need to succeed in your exams. And if you wanna submit a draft and get expert marking, or you wanna use our marking tools to get specific suggestions on how you can improve your essays, your creative writing pieces, anytime, anywhere, make sure you sign up to Jedi. It's less than $10 per week. Okay, so we've got the approach, we've got the right mindset, we're gonna adapt, we're gonna shape this around our argument that we want to make, we've got our material in mind. We now need to prioritize the words of the question and make sure they're the focus of our argument in terms of the way that our points are actually worded. Every sentence needs to emphasize these key terms. And we're not getting carried away with the whole to what extent do you agree thing. We are going to make it very clear what our position is and the marker will know to what extent you agreed without you actually having to say that explicitly. But you also look for points and you'll, you'll think about this for a second. You'll think, is there something I could add in that goes beyond what the question or the statement is suggesting? Or is there some way that I could actually disagree with this? And sometimes certain statements lend themselves more to disagreements than others. So look out for that. This question isn't so much something I would strongly disagree with. I think you can largely agree with it, but again, you don't have to actually say that. So how do we break down the question? Well, there's three steps. There are three steps to breaking down this specific question in order to get you towards a band six thesis statement, which is what I'm gonna show you by the end. So what are those three steps? The three steps to break down any question are the following. One, identify the key terms. There aren't as many key terms as you think in a question. You're looking for two, maybe three key words or phrases that are really the focal point of the question. And even within that, something I do, I like to just try and find one word. If I had to reduce this question to one word in that question, what would it be? And that really helps me focus in on the important parts. Otherwise, if you think every word is important, every word's key, 
Well, yes, every word's important, otherwise they wouldn't have asked you the question in that way. So make sure you read the whole question. But the key terms is different. The key terms is to actually help you focus in on something rather than repeat the question throughout your essay. We don't wanna repeat the whole question. We want you to actually unpack it by understanding what the key terms are and knowing that you need to go beyond those key terms. So let's identify the key terms. Secondly, we need to then expand on those key terms. So say a key term is power, we need to expand on the word power. We can't just repeat it, it's not enough. We wanna say the word power, we don't wanna use synonyms. We wanna use the actual key terms of the question, but then we need to go one step further and say something about that key term. And that's how you're actually going to answer the question rather than repeat the question. So mini questions is the way you do that. Mini questions is about asking yourself the correct questions to help you actually unpack that key term. And the third step is to relate and separate the key terms of the question. So if the question gives you multiple theme words like power and corruption, the one thing you never want to do is to group those words together in your essay. It's your job to see those key terms and separate them and see how one of those affects the other. Like how does someone's motivation for power lead to cause and effect the corruption of their morals? So we need to take power and corruption and split them and expand on each one, but also show how they're connected. But what you'd never want to do is to say in your essay, the text explores power and corruption. You never want to group them together. There's a reason that the question gave you those two separate words, and it's not so that you could just treat them as one and the same and group them. Never group or bundle key terms together in your sentences. The question does it, but you won't do it. You'll separate them, expand on each one, unpack them, and see how there's a relationship between those key terms. That's what the best responses will do. Now let's go through those steps for this particular question. So for the 2023 HSE question, the key terms would be collective human experiences and our view of the world. Now, I wanna be specific here. So a text can ignite ideas about, they're all important words. I mean, a text can ignite idea, ideas about, but what's the key word that's clearly come from the rubric? collective human experiences. It's actually given us a specific type of human experience that it wants us to focus on. Yes, human experiences is the name of the whole module, but if it actually includes those words in the question, that is a key term. You need to say what the relevant human experiences are. You would do that either way, but you need to actually do it more explicitly. You need to actually use those key terms more now in your essay. And we need to focus on collective human experiences rather than individual. Doesn't mean you don't talk about individual human experiences. That's how you extend beyond the question. And you should still be using other rubric terms anyway, but we need to focus on collective. That's the emphasis now. So collective human experiences is a key term that enrich our view of the world, our worldview. Now, what does that mean? That means like our perspective. And it's important to quickly brainstorm some synonyms or other ways that you could interpret those key terms so that you, are, you feel comfortable with it. If I'm looking at enrich our view of the world, I'm thinking our worldview, our perspective, our understanding of something. If I'm seeing the word enrich, I'm thinking, it probably means to deepen our worldview, to give us a deeper understanding of the world, right? How we see the world is going to change. So enrich means it's gonna change our worldview, but in a positive way. It's gonna actually give us a deeper understanding or appreciation of something about the world. Okay, so other words for these key terms as well, collective human experiences, I'm thinking shared human experiences. Not that I wanna use synonyms, I'm doing that so I can actually get comfortable with these key terms and I can apply it more broadly and flexibly to any other material that I really wanted to use in the essay. Not so much specific wording, but any points you wanted to make. The more that you can break down those key terms and define them to yourself, the better you'll be able to find spots to actually merge them in and adapt them to your essay structure. Okay, so collective human experiences and view of the world are our key terms. Let's go to step two. Now that we've identified our key terms, we need to expand on them. It's not enough to just identify them and repeat them in your essay, especially when you're gonna do your thesis statement in your introduction. So what we need to do now is ask ourselves certain mini questions, micro questions, like what or what type, like how, like why, like so what. We're gonna ask those questions about each key term so that we can actually provide 
a specific insight about them so that we can say something specific that goes beyond the words of the question. This is how you will avoid repeating the question. This is how you expand on the question. Even though we want you to use the exact words of the question in terms of collective and worldview or view of the world, you still need to add more to those. You need to expand on those. So if you ask questions like what or what type, that allows you to actually define what type of collective human experience it is or what the relevant experience is in your prescribed text. So we're gonna go through an example of that. And an example would be what type of collective human experience is in 1984 or The Crucible or Merchant of Venice? Well, in 1984, a type of collective human experience, so an adjective or describing word that we can put before the word collective is going to be something like oppressive. It's an oppressive collective human experience when Big Brother is controlling everyone. That's very oppressive. You don't feel like you're very free. Okay, great. So I'm going to use the word oppressive before the word collective so that I can now provide a little bit more specificity. I'm actually now expanding it. I'm adding some words around it. So the text ignites ideas about oppressive collective human experiences. But what are those human experiences? Human experiences of what? Or let's just narrow it down to one key human experience and we can refer to other collective human experiences throughout the essay. So let's just get it down to one. An example here, what type of collective human experience? We're gonna put an adjective like oppressive before the key term collective human experience. We're then gonna use the word of so that we can answer the question what? What human experience? The human experience of what? This is how you're gonna break it down. So we're gonna say an oppressive collective experience of something. Maybe is it psychological control? If we're thinking about 1984, is Big Brother trying to control you? For your prescribed text, think about what that core human experience is that possibly is one of conflict. That's the problem. What's the problem in your text? What's the challenging human experience in your text? because it's always good to start with that broad challenge in perspective, and then you can work towards the resolution if there is one. We can also ask the so what question. So what means, why should we care? What's the significance of that? So just because 1984 is about an oppressive collective human experience of psychological control, note how I just really expanded on the words of the question there. Why should we care about that? Well, because if you have an experience of psychological control where someone's controlling your thoughts, you are not going to have individual freedom. So watch how we actually break this down now. We're gonna use an adjective, followed by the key term, followed by of, followed by something specific. Here we go. It's an oppressive collective human experience of psychological control. Notice the word of forced us to put something in there. That's what you should all be doing after you use a key word. And then we put comma, which threatens individual freedom. Now that's just one example that's pretty broad, but at least you're seeing how we're answering the what type, oppressive, what human experience, psychological control, and so what? Because they were the most relevant mini questions. You don't have to answer all of them. They're just to give you food for thought so that you can actually expand when you incorporate the words of the question into your essay. So every time you use a key term, you can at least put an adjective before it that's relevant and you can at least say something more specific about it after. So here, it threatens individual freedom. Okay. What about the other key term, our view of the world? Let's have a look at that one. Okay, so this is about how those ideas enrich our view of the world. Well, what type of world is it? Notice how we just keep asking these questions. What type? It's a pretty unconscious world. Now, for those who are familiar with 1984, you'll understand that unconscious, people aren't that aware of what's going on. And that's the whole point of the novel, that people need to wake up. People need to realize that they're being controlled, that Big Brother or dictators in this case, like Stalin and Hitler, they're the kinds of people who are going to control your thoughts. They're going to control your understanding of the truth. They're going to manipulate reality. So the world as it is, is probably pretty unconscious, unaware of how bad the situation has gotten. So I'm going to use that adjective. You could use other words like naive or ignorant or disempowered, anything that seems relevant to you. And by the way, the way that you answer these mini questions should be based on the kind of material that you would have in a draft essay. Use what you already have. Use your current understanding to answer these questions. The next question that you might ask is, what world is this? So you've got the type of world. If we're talking about our world, our view of the world, 
And in that case, we're thinking about the audience. We're thinking about when the text was written around 1949 after World War II for 1984. Well, what world is that contextually? Well, a good adjective for that is post-war. If it's after World War II, we call it post-war. Or maybe you say early Cold War. We can use an adjective there to actually label the type of world that we are talking about when we talk about our view of the world. The phrase view of the world, right? That's quite a long phrase with a lot of words. You'll have a much better chance of providing a sophisticated breakdown of a question if you break those words up a little bit. So even though it's view of the world, you could rephrase that as world view, but you could also just say a type of view of the type of world. Like you don't have to always say view of the world, view of the world. Break those up, separate those words up a little bit because the fewer words that there are that you're focusing on, the easier it is to expand and be flexible. If you have big chunky phrases that you're trying to expand on, that becomes quite limiting. So it's good to break that phrase up in this case. And then finally, how? How is our view of the world enriched? Well, it teaches us about the danger of totalitarian leadership. That's the type of leadership in 1984, for example. Think about what the significance is in your text. What's a lesson that you learn? What, what are you being enriched with? I bet in any draft essay that you've prepared, you talk about what the understanding is that people are being given or what is the key lesson or insight? What's the key takeaway? I bet you already have that. You should already have that. That's what you then use in this part of the sentence, but you can retain the same point that you originally wanted to make. So let's look at an example for our phrase here. We're going to say that these ideas, they enrich the responder's unconscious view of the post-war world. See how we broke those down before? Instead of just saying view of the world, we're saying it's an unconscious view of the post-war world. So break up the phrase that we've called the key term and put in some specific adjectives, some describing words to give some more specificity to your answer. This is what the best students do. So just think, what type, what type, what type of view, what type of world is it? If you just keep asking what type, you're already halfway there. Then you need to expand on the other side and you can see here we're saying, well, what have you been enriched with? It's enriching you with an understanding of the dystopian potential of totalitarian leadership. That's what your view or understanding of the world is enriched with. It's understanding how bad things can get with the dystopian potential of totalitarian leadership, that's the something specific that you should always have. And the word with in this case has operated like our word of. So it's not always gonna be of after the word. Sometimes it's gonna be with or between, but there's gonna be some word that you should use after the key term that then forces you to expand on it with something specific. So they're the first two steps. The last thing is we need to relate this stuff together. So let's have a look at that. Okay, so the last step is we need to relate and separate those key terms. Now, the key terms in this question are pretty much already separated because the question kind of divides them up into collective human experiences that enrich our view of the world. So it's not like you have two theme words next to each other, like power and corruption. Sometimes you just get two key words with the word end between them, in which case you really need to separate them. But in this case, the question's kind of lending itself to what I'd call a cause and effect relationship. And you should always look for this type of relationship between the key terms in a question. Okay, now cause and effect means that because we have these ideas about collective human experiences, that is going to lead to the audience, the responder, the reader being enriched with a new understanding of the world. So clearly you need to have the ideas first in the text for you to be enriched. So the question already provides a cause and effect relationship, but you should consider that for any question, okay? Think about how the different parts of the question relate to each other, and then we're gonna separate them out. So let's have a look at that in practice. Orwell represents the oppressive collective human experience of psychological control, which threatens individual freedom in order to, we still need to do that, right? So in order to enrich, the responder's unconscious view of the post-war world with the dystopian potential of totalitarian leadership. Hopefully you are now seeing how it's all coming together. We're thinking about the key terms, we're thinking about how we can break them down, and now we're gonna put them into this cause and effect relationship so that we can see how everything works together. All right, I think we're ready for it. Band six example, let's have a look at it. 
So for this example, all we're adding in are just some formalities. So in his prose fiction novel, because you should always say the exact text type, the exact form of the text, in his prose fiction novel, 1984, it's 1984 in words, not digits. And then in brackets, you also need to have the date, the date of publication, which you can just look up. It's always good to put the date of publication in. You only have to do all of this at the start, and then you can just refer to the author's last name when you say what's, what's happening. So Orwell suggests, etc. So in his prose fiction novel, 1984, George Orwell represents, we're just using represents, I know that the question had ignite ideas about, but something you don't wanna do is use the word ideas. I'd rather just give the idea. We've focused on the more important words here, and that's what the markers are really looking for. But where you can, if you can see a spot to get ignite or idea in, do it, but don't say the word idea without actually saying the idea that, and say the actual idea. That's the problem with using the word ideas. Orwell represents the oppressive collective human experience of psychological control. You can see where I've used the actual keywords of the question. We're not using synonyms. We're using the actual keywords. You'll be tempted to use synonyms because you're afraid that you're gonna repeat the question. But you're only gonna repeat the question if you don't expand on the key terms. And because we're doing both, this is the best type of response. It does use the actual words, but it does more than that. It provides a specific insight. So it represents the oppressive collective human experience of psychological control, which threatens individual freedom. Look at all that additional insight that the question didn't provide. You're providing it. And I'm providing that based on my prior understanding of the text. And a, a lot of this, to be honest, would be from my draft essays. If I have one core draft and I've practiced adapting it to lots of different questions, it's probably much the same. I'm just prioritizing the words of the question and working them in. That's the art of this. That's the skill set that you will get better at by practicing adapting to different questions before the exam. In order to enrich the responder's unconscious view of the post-war world with the dystopian potential of totalitarian leadership. So there are all the pieces glued together. We got some formalities in there, if that was our very first sentence, which we're assuming this is. And what you can see here is that we've not only included the key terms of the question, but we've included tons of expansion. In fact, it's majority orange, the expanded parts. Oppressive of psychological control, which threatens individual freedom. Responder's unconscious view of the post-war world with the dystopian potential of totalitarian leadership. All of that is new. That's based on your understanding. That's the insight you're providing. Now compare that with the worst type of response that you could do, which would be to just repeat the question. In his prose fiction novel, George Orwell represents collective human experiences to enrich our view of the world. That's exactly what the question said. And the reason that students like to use synonyms is because they'll just replace this. They'll just say shared human experiences to amplify our understanding of the world. They'll, they'll basically repeat the question, but in slightly different terms and think that was better than just doing this. They're both equally as bad and you want to avoid both of those scenarios. You definitely don't want to have that first sentence of your essay be your warm up sentence. Because what students often do is they feel the pressure of the exam. They feel like they need to write something down straight away. And their first sentence does repeat the question. And then they go on to say something more specific. You're better off forgetting about that first one, or if it helps you think to unpack the question, you can write it down, but cross it out after and start your essay with the specific answer that uses the keywords. Don't just repeat the question in your first sentence. So if you feel like you're often tempted to just rewrite the question in your very first sentence, write it down when you're practicing, then cross it out and just keep what you write after. It's going to sound a lot better because you're actually getting into the specific points you wanna make. So you can see the clear difference there. That's someone repeating the question and that's someone who actually uses the same key words but provides a lot more specific insight by unpacking the question with those mini questions. What type? What is the collective human experience? Ask yourself and you will be able to answer those questions. You've learned the text, you understand the text to some extent. Some of you might think, oh, I don't really understand it. But you know the basic ideas. Just fill in the blanks with those things and make sure you've actually incorporated all the key terms, ideally all the key terms into your first one to two sentences where you really show how they all relate to one another. Because that was that third element. We need to relate. We need to make sure we're actually addressing the relationship between the fact that there are these ideas about collective human experiences and then they have this impact on the responder to enrich their worldview. 
So that's an example of a band six quality expansion of the question, could be your first sentence. And you can practice doing that with a range of different questions. All right, I hope that helps. If you enjoyed, please do me a favor and subscribe to the channel. Even if you've only got a couple weeks left, you might just be starting year 12. You might be looking at this from afar, but subscribe to the channel now if you enjoyed it and I'll see you in the next one.